Buddhism is healing therapy. You know? I mean, you, you all are in the healing uh, profession, so this, I, I thought this is a good start for us too. Uh, I'd like to st start with a, a very important, very simple question. Let's see. You know, there, there's many religions in the world, but I think there is one idea which unites all religion, all faiths, and even science. You know, a very key idea. What would you think that idea would be? Yeah, just try. Just, just you know, open your mind and just. What, what do you think? Anyone like to start? Yeah, what idea do you think unify all religion, underlie, underpins all religion, including Buddhism? Yeah. Yeah, good person. <laughs> yeah, okay. What, what else? What about you? Any idea? J just offhand, doesn't matter. I'm inclined to agree with uh, Li Hui. Just All right. generally having a wholesome mm. quality. So All right, okay. Staying away from All right. No, you, you're right. That, that is the particular aspect. Uh, I was thinking more of some kind of philosophical or, or some doctrinal, some kind of idea that unifies all religion. Yeah, I mean, being good is yes, definitely there. Okay. Should I try? Maybe attaining happiness. Happiness, okay. Yes. To give a sort of a idea or face to the afterlife. Ah, afterlife, eh? okay. So an idea, what idea do you think underlies all religion? So you're, you're saying religion talks about afterlife, okay. <coughs> Waiting for anything? Maybe. What key idea? Salvation. I mean, Salvation. Mm, okay, yeah, sure, salvation. Yes, doctor? Search for peace and happiness and okay. uh, reduction of uh, pain. Pain. Mental. Oh, uh, okay, so great. Mm, mm, okay. Yes? Uh, search for the meaning of life. Meaning of life, yeah, okay, we're talking about that. William, anything? Uh, sustenance. Sustenance. You mean supporting life, is it? The opposite of oh, okay. Life. Okay, great. You, you all have sh look at different aspects of religion. Uh, to me, from what I've studied, especially Buddhism, the key word here is change. Change. In other words, if you say uh, Buddhism teaches change, I don't think any religion can say you're wrong. You know, and, and this is also another interesting thing where you don't have to believe in it, or you can you can simply believe in it, or you can use your intellect and say, okay, let me investigate more. Either way, change is always there, and this is under this is underpins the whole of Buddhism. If you are not sure what Buddhism is, it starts there. Change. Remember the three characteristics of Buddhism. Uh, in Pali, is anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence unsatisfactoriness or suffering and non-self. Those are the three basic ideas in Buddhism. Okay? The first one is change. So if you understand change, basically you will go on to deeper into Buddhism. All right? and, and change is also important in a sense that uh, it, it, it has to do with healing also. We can heal ourselves because we change. And if there's no change, then you know, the medical sciences won't be workable anyway. Change. Ne? Uh, of course, change includes things like evolution, growth, development, right? You can go on to psychology processes, you know. And these are all very important concepts in Buddhism, uh, this idea of processes. Okay, you can even say Buddhism is a, is a process psychology, process spirituality, if you like. So, <clears throat> And uh, what happens to, to a Buddhist is Buddhist, the Buddhists see change and then they themselves or he himself or I myself, you yourself, change accordingly. And that has to happen. And uh, once you have this kind of idea, there are other very important ramifications. For example, there's no point holding on to your opinion. If you have a fixed opinion, you find you don't change. For example, you know, I've been a Buddhist for 50 years now. I'm, I'll be 70 next year. In the last 50 years, the last 10 years especially, I've been changing a lot of my views about Buddhism. It's not that I like Buddhism less. In fact, I like Buddhism more. But I begin to see uh, so many new things I miss out. You know? And you know, I'm doing full-time translation work, and that helps a lot for me to go in-depth. 
So this idea of knowing more and changing, and, and as, as we change, something happens to us. You feel, you feel better, basically. You feel less stress, and you feel very happy. And that's something not easy in, in, in life. No? So if you look at the life of the Buddha, uh, one of the most famous or a set of episodes is he saw the four sides, right? You remember? Of the four sides. Anyway, it's okay, we don't remember. What made him live his comfortable, palatial life? He was a young man, let's say, imagine, I have to imagine he's 20 years old, maybe 30 years old, you know, around that age. He led such a luxurious life, maybe, we, we call it flooding in psychology, because he had so much of all this uh, enjoyment and luxury, that in the end you ask yourself, is that all? You know, imagine you get everything you want in terms of sensuality and, and all those pleasures, you know, as a young man. So he felt, is that, is that all? That kind of idea. So one day he saw this old man and he, got, he came as a shock to him. He said, what's going on here? He has to ask his charioteer. So he realized there is uh, decay. Then he saw a sick man, there is disease. He saw a dead man, there is death. I call this the three Ds. Decay, disease, death. And this is what shocked him. See, remember, these are all aspects of changes, but it came to him as a very traumatic experience because he's been enjoying himself all this while. Suddenly, he sees something different. This challenged him of all his, his mindset, you see. But then he saw the false side. And the false side is the healing aspect of these first three, the three Ds of life. You know? The false side is this very calm, holy man who show no sign of suffering, is very happy. So, this Siddhartha, as his name is, the Buddha, he asks, well, who are you? So this, he says, I'm a holy man, I'm a renunciant. The word is renunciant, that means he has let go of the world. So that gave him the hint how to overcome this three Ds, decay, disease, death. So he took that life. Imagine he sacrificed all these wonderful pleasures and to take this path. Because he saw that this is the path of healing. And of course, he's trying to discover what lies beyond that. What is the meaning of life? Now, you've heard of the Four Noble Truths, right? The first truth is that of that there is suffering, that there's something unsatisfactory. In fact, the, the Four Noble Truths are a medical model. The, in the Buddha's time, Apparently, it is said that the Buddha himself introduced this model of the Four Noble Truths, starting with the idea that there is a disease, this first truth, and then there is this, uh, the causes of it, the conditions that bring it about, okay? What was the medical term for that? The, the causes and all that? Or, or how do you say that? The, I suppose you say causes, huh? Etiology. Sorry? Etiology. Etiology, okay. Oh, that's philosophy too, yeah, okay. And then, so okay, so these two, truth one and two, talks about meaning of life. If, in other words, if you look around, what do you see? What does, it, what does life mean? You see someone old, sick, dying. What does it mean? That something is unsatisfactory. And then, why does this happen? That's the second question he asks. So this is the meaning of life. Then after that, he found a path. It's called the Eightfold Path. Okay? And then he practices it, he's awakened. Now this, so this truth number three and four form what are called the purpose of life. Truth three and four changes us, the path. Okay? So, what is this path? Now, as you know, a path means movement. Path means you need personal effort. Movement means change. Remember, I, I used the theme of change earlier on. And then there is personal effort. You have to do it yourself. And this is a very important thing in Buddhism. That is why in Buddhism we do not have conversion. Because you have to do it yourself. I mean, it's like you're a doctor. You heal people. You can't get well for someone. This person has to get well. All that you can do is point out to this person. So the Buddha is just like that. There's a Pali term, akataro. If you translate literally, it means one who points out. So it's like a doctor, he says, well, you are sick, okay? So these are the causes. First two truths. Then he says, okay, this is what you have to do. 
And then number, truth number four, you do it, take your medicine and so on. Okay? This, the, as I said, this is the medical model. And this is interesting because uh, apparently no one has kept, come up with this idea. It, it, the Buddha was the first person that came up with this idea. And, and uh, the Buddha also seems to, this is one aspect not many of us know, he actually is quite familiar with traditional medicine. In the Vinaya collection, the Vinaya collection are the set of rules for the monks, the conduct of the monks. There is a whole chapter called the Besajja Kanda. Besajja means medicine in Indian language. It's a chapter on medicine. And the Buddha lists all the kind of cures and health uh, tips for the monks. Because these monks, they live alone in the forest, you see. So they have to learn how to take care of themselves. For example, the snake bite, uh, uh, you must recognize what sort of leaves can be eaten, things like that. So this idea of medicine is there in Buddhism. And some researchers, like someone called Zisk, Z-Y-S-K, he even did research and he said that it was the, the Buddha who introduced the Indian traditional medicine. And, and later, the, it came to be known by the Ayurveda and so on. So this one aspect of Buddhism, not many people know, that we do go back to the roots of Indian traditional medicine. So you can see the, the healing aspect of Buddhism even there, in terms of medicine. Yeah? So the, when we talk about the path, the path, I mentioned just now, there's movement, there is change, there's personal effort. The first part of the training in the path is called training in moral virtue. Now you know the five precepts and uh, moral virtue. Here, the, the training deals with the body and speech. Okay, so in other words, you have to discipline your body and speech first if you want to practice the Buddhist path. The reason for this is because this is our social uh, image to society. So if you present yourself as uh, restrained or as calm, as civil in body and speech, society is possible. And you are also we say in Buddhism, you are bodily cultivated, physically cultivated. Okay, so we need this calmness of body and speech to allow mental development. That is a second training, training in mental cultivation. And that's the more important one. The second training, training of the mind. So first is training with the body. The body has to be harmony in harmony with everyone else. Then training of the mind. So second training. So here. Training of mind means to see things as they are. It brings wisdom. This is a third training. Wisdom means seeing things as they really are. Now the question is, how is it that we do not see things as they really are? It's because we depend on our senses. We are totally dependent on our physical senses, the five senses. The Buddha made a remarkable statement about this. He wants, it's a very short sutta discourse. He asked the monks, uh, what is the all? If you think of everything, what is this everything? What is this all? In philosophy, this is called epistemology. In other words, what can we know? And his answer is very simple. It says, the all are your five senses. He actually add the mind, it's number six. I, ear, nose, tongue, body mind. So he says, whatever you can know, can only be known through the five senses and the mind. And whatever you can know are the objects of the five senses. Okay, that's the, the basis. Okay? I mean, this is like a modern statement in psychology. You, know? you, you, don't, you don't see this statement in other religions. So, so the modern psychologists are amazed at this kind of statement. Okay, this is much, it's much more than this. Meditation and so on. Alright, so Back to the question, how is it that we don't see things as they really are? I mean, if you're a scientist and medical student, you probably, if you're psychology, you have a better idea. Very often we see things, but our perception tells us a different story, right? So here is because we often project what, when we see something, we don't really see what's going on there. We tend to project a family image from our past into the present. So this is called delusion, and this creates uh, this problem of perception. We don't really see things as they really are. And this is what Buddhists also have to work with. In meditation, 
we calm ourselves so that we can clearly see what's going on out there. And that is the beginning of mental health. So here we have body, we have mind. Now the question is, uh, where does health fit in here? Because so here we have uh, another sutta, an, an old man comes along, I ask the Buddha, he says, look, I, I'm, I'm very old, you know, you don't give me a long teaching, just give me something very short to reflect on. And this is something I think you should find very helpful in your profession. Yeah? You can tell your patients this wonderful statement. The Buddha tells this old man, you, say, reflect in this way, my body may be sick, but let not my mind be sick. Okay? Although my body is sick, let not my mind be sick. So here, in other words, the Buddha already recognized there are two kinds of sickness, bodily and mental. Uh, we may not be able to control the bodily sickness, the body is frail, the body falls sick, you know, there are germs. But mentally we can have a, a, a kind of a good attitude that's able to help us heal faster or even prevent sickness. Okay, so this is one of the statements he made. So this awareness of two kinds of health is a, another very important teaching in Buddhism that we need to understand how our senses work and how our mind works. How, to, how the senses work, you can say uh, the practice of the precepts, how the mind works, the practice of meditation, and when you understand how your mind works, wisdom is more likely to arise. And wisdom here refers to seeing things as they really are, and when you see things as they really are, you feel joy, you feel happy about it, because you, you, you know what to do about life. So, uh, there is a bit of interesting three lines given here on, on, on what I've said so far. Let me summarize it this way. Uh, once the Buddha said, the past is gone. The future never comes. Even the present moves on. You see, this is a reflection of the three periods of time. Okay? So the basic wisdom here means we understand the nature of this change to our lives. And uh, what we need to do now is to understand the difference between what is real and what appears real. And in other words, we have to understand the difference between virtual reality and true reality. So in Buddhism, we try to understand the nature of true reality. How do we do this? We go back to what we started just now. There is change in everything. So if you recognize this change, you are able to see what's going on better here. Okay? Now, I'm going to end here, then I will invite questions. I think it would be much more interesting that way.